So tonight, I want to talk about the simplest and easiest way to get out of suffering, to overcome every obstacle in your life, to move beyond fear and worry, to move beyond bad relationships, trauma, addiction, intrusive thoughts. Beyond everything that could and has possibly made you suffer in this life. And it's so simple. And it's the process that I discovered beyond religion, even beyond what most people call spirituality, beyond New Age, And in fact, this method, this formula, if I can call it that for a moment, won't interfere with your religion or your belief system. It won't interfere with how you feel in fact, it's going to take you deeper into your truest self. Deeper into who you really are and how you feel. This is how you unprogram your mind from that which you are stuck in that causes you to suffer. If we look at the average life, you are born and you were raised, taught in a certain way that your parents either saw fit or were stuck in themselves and they implied that information onto you knowingly or unknowingly there were things from your childhood that you remember to be amazing maybe it was a birthday party maybe it was a trip to Disney World Maybe it was sitting and watching TV with a parent. Maybe it was dinner time. But for most people, there are also a lot of bad memories. Even for the average person. But especially for someone who was abused or went through some type of trauma. And so, by the time you become a teenager and you have this mixture of experiences, good and bad, you are on this path of trying to resist and avoid what you consider to be bad and to chase after what you consider to be good. In that process of running from something and chasing after something, you create more suffering for yourself. Unknowingly, because you're just trying to achieve A while avoiding B, for example. And eventually, many people find something to stabilize their happiness. 
For some people, it could be even religion or church. They feel if they continue to go and get this experience that is positive, it's what helps stabilize all of the negative in their life. For others, it could be video games or TV or food. Um, it could be addiction. And then now, you have the good that you're chasing after. You have the bad that you're avoiding. And then you have something in between that you feel is stabilizing you, that's keeping you going, that's motivating you. For some people, it's money. The reason I say good and bad, because there may be something good, but the fact that you are dependent on it increasingly with time, even that too becomes something that we could put in the category of bad. But this category of bad stuff, you're stuck because you don't see it as bad. And so you're stuck chasing after this until eventually there's some kind of crash. Which is very much what happened to me in the year 2000 when I had my second spiritual awakening. And we're going to get to that term in just a moment. What is spiritual awakening? But I had found myself at the age of 28 chasing after multiple addictions every day. and trying to continuously stabilize this feeling of control over my life and avoiding bad things to happen. Now, when I say bad things, trying to avoid all the little intricate negative things that people believe to be in their life, I'm not talking about tragedies. I'm talking about asking someone out and them saying no. We try to avoid something like that. I'm talking about you go and get a haircut and it doesn't turn out the way you want it. So that's something bad that happened to you. And for most people, there are hundreds of these little things that happen every day. And it builds up this, this wall of programming that we have to face every day. And if it gets negative enough, then people try to find a way out from that. So then we become adults. We find relationships that we believe. We find love, usually only to find out it wasn't what we really wanted. It wasn't real, unconditional love. It was what can you do for me and what can I do for you in exchange and help stabilize each other so that we feel like we are in control of this life? And many of us know that does not work either. So you find yourself, most people do, in their 20s and 30s, broken relationships, Childhood traumas, bad memories, addictions, even if that addiction is Red Bull, or even if that addiction is something that, that is seemingly minute, it's still something that we place in our mind as being dependent on in order to be happy or to have something worth looking forward to. Maybe it's a piece of chocolate cake. Maybe it's driving fast in a car and becoming exhilarated. You see, any and all of it is something that is moving us one step closer to suffering. Because if any of this gets changed, and, and you already know because you've been through all of this stuff in life, 
it eventually comes to a point where people break. And many people hit rock bottom, even if, even if they have a job and money and a house and and cars and food. They have this breaking point because I just can't keep up this charade anymore. And that's all that it is. It's a charade. It's a game. It's a script. Some people call it the Matrix. If you go to psychology and ask them how to get out of that, perhaps they may set you up for a few years worth of appointments in psychotherapy. Or maybe they suggest putting you on some kind of medicine, such as an antidepressant. Although these things may have their benefit, they won't take you to freedom. So maybe you try this method or that method. Some people try religion, and it feels great for a while to be a part of a church that believes in the same God, and this God that's going to save you. And, and, and people who first get into it have all this fervor Yes, I'm free. But all the people I have seen and even experienced myself that, that move into that solution often end up right back in the same place. And now they're just doubting God. Why is God doing this to me? How can I avoid these things that God is going to punish me for? And how can I chase after the reward that God has for me? So religion just becomes another part of the dualistic system that keeps you bound in a dualistic world that doesn't really exist. You only believe it to exist. And it just keeps churning. So some find psychology, some find religion, some find some other method. And these things have their place in our society for sure. I'm not suggesting we discard everything and do this one simple thing that I'm going to suggest. But it all can work in tandem and you can find that everlasting solution with this simple method, if we can call it that, because it's not really a method. And even if you just take a moment and trust what I'm saying, not because of anything about who I am, but, but trust what I'm saying because it resonates with you or even if you're just curious, I'm not asking anybody for money. I have nothing to sell. There's no membership that you have to sign up for. There's nothing. I'm just here sitting, making this video with you tonight and inviting you into this space So come as you are as we move forward in this video. Nothing you need to change. You don't need to change your language. You don't need to speak more eloquent. You don't even have to use terms like spiritual awakening or unprogram your mind. Just be yourself. Step number one is to recognize that you suffer. And it is to recognize you suffer because of something that's going on in your mind. How your mind reacts to the world. How your mind reacts to your spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend. 
how your mind reacts to how you view your body. How your mind reacts to what you think this life is about. How your mind reacts to something that is said or done to you at work. So let's take a look at the mind for just a moment. The mind projects images. And it projects them into what we call the imagination. I call it the field of imagination. It's like a movie screen. It's in your mind. If you close your eyes and I say, can you picture a red wagon? And that image comes up in your mind. Or maybe the feeling, the energetic feeling of what a, of what a red wagon is. Either way, it's this movie screen playing out in your mind. We don't need to know anything about psychology or neuroscience or religion or spirituality. You don't need to read any books. You don't need to do any of this. You can, if you are guided to do so, but it's not a prerequisite. So you say, okay, yes, of course, I have thoughts that come into my mind. Some thoughts are good, some thoughts are bad, right? Well, how you determine whether a thought is good or bad is based on how you were programmed to see it. If you were programmed to not like the mailman or the mailwoman, because maybe you grew up poor, and every time the mail would come, it meant a bill or it meant some kind of problem. And you witnessed this growing up. Then maybe you're 33 years old and still don't quite understand why you don't like the mail person. So you consider that bad, a bad feeling. All of these dualistic feelings good versus bad has been programmed into us. Now some of it is good to have programmed into us. Like how to be clean. How to have compassion and be courteous to other people. There's definitely some basics that we learn there that we're not going to try to unprogram ourselves from. In fact, we're not going to try to unprogram ourselves from anything. It's going to happen naturally using this method. So step one is to recognize that yes, you suffer and you suffer because your mind shows you images or puts thoughts that guide you in ways that don't feel good to you. That you place judgment on things that cause further stress. You think about if you don't like a certain race of people. Perhaps maybe that was programmed into you as well when you were younger. And so maybe you did good for yourself to move to a side of town where that race don't exist. And then maybe after a few years, that race starts to move in. And then you say, wow, look at this neighborhood, look what it's become, etc., etc. And you're considering this experience to be a bad experience when in reality, it's a neutral experience. It's a factual experience. People move in, people move out. So step number one is to realize that you most certainly have been programmed to believe, to think, to feel how you believe, think, and feel. Again, some of your feelings are going to be true to yourself. We're not trying to remove those. We're trying to weed out the ones that don't help you, that don't remove suffering. We're trying to remove all of that which does not belong to you. And for most people, most of it does not belong to them.
So if you come to the realization in step one, if you can honestly say to yourself or out loud or speak to this video even and say, yes, Billy, I understand. I've been programmed. What I do is mostly based on what I've been told to do or what I'm expected to do. And that creates a life that's not fully mine. And it creates a life of suffering. And I find that I'm running from some things and I'm chasing after others. And when I run from things and they catch up with me, I suffer even more. Or if I chase after something and I don't achieve it, then I suffer even more. Then we can go to step two. And this was the biggest realization that I had in the year 2000. Step number two is, if I can witness all of my suffering, all of my pain, all of my trauma, if these memories can show up in this imagination, this field of imagination, if I can look out into the world and I can see me placing judgment on this race or this gender or this job title, if I can see all of this, which we're going to sum up as the mind, if I can see my mind unfold and suffer, then who am I that's doing the seeing? You know, if I had an object, this bracelet, if I can witness this bracelet, then I know in my consciousness that I am not the bracelet. I am the consciousness witnessing the bracelet. Our mind is also an object that can be witnessed with our consciousness. We've been doing it our whole life. It's, it's not like something new. Now, if we get too lost into our mind, we forget that we are consciousness. We forget that we are spiritual beings living out a human life in this body with this mind. Almost everybody forgets that. Until we make the realization, number one, we've been programmed and that everything we see is filtered by this program. Step number two, if I can witness these filters, this program, this conditioning, and then what am I if not the programs themselves? Who am I if I'm not my mind? If I'm not my thoughts, even though I've been chasing these thoughts, if the thought says jump, I jump. If the thought says break up with this person, I break up with them. If the thought says do this drug, I do this drug. I've just been following this flow of thoughts, this program. So step number two is to realize there is something else besides mind. There's something else besides suffering. It's simple. We don't have to make this any more complicated than it is. Step number three. Investigate what this something else is. Now, I can call it consciousness. We can call it the soul, the spirit. Let's call it the spirit for just a moment. Your spirit has the ability to travel. Now, maybe I'm getting a little bit weird here for some people, but bear with me for a moment. Your spirit has the ability to travel. 
it's not tied to this body. It feels like it's tied to this body because it's all we've ever known. It's all we've ever been programmed to know. Until you have an out-of-body experience and then you realize there's something else. So step three is to stay as the something else, the witness. Without chasing after or following everything that the mind tells you to do. We don't have to unprogram ourselves. It happens by itself when we stay as this presence. And this is why we call it a spiritual awakening because we wake back up to the spiritual essence of who we are. Because we have seemingly fallen asleep and unaware of the spiritual side because we got locked into the movie playing in our minds that goes on and on and on. It's kind of like when you binge watch a show. Let me just say Stranger Things. Or the chosen. Or anything. Seinfeld. And you binge watch this and you become somewhat emotionally attached to the characters, to what's happening in the movie. To the point that even your own physical body begins to tense up in some moments, relax in other moments. And there's a part of your subconscious that believes you are now a part of what you are watching. Because the brain doesn't always know the difference between what is being seen or displayed or felt and what is real. So sometimes it gets confused. And our program is to not look at the confusion and not to investigate. The program is to just believe and keep going. Whether we're talking about governments, whether we're talking about conspiracies, whatever it is we are taught. And sometimes we revolt against what our parents taught. And we go from this to this. Where did we get this? We got this from someone else who programmed it into us. So we're just bouncing around from one program to another. We're trading in one false identity for another false identity. How do we get rid of all of these false identities? And how can we be free from suffering without the need of all this extra programming? Step number three is to stay as that which is not the mind, the witness, the awareness, the presence. This is why Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now, it's the whole point of it. Because when we are just simply here in the moment, we are the witness. We're not chasing nor are we resisting. We are just here observing. And in that observation, as rocky as it may be in the beginning, eventually stabilizes into something that does not come and go. It stabilizes into something that you do not have to chase after, nor do you have to try to avoid And this type of stabilization manifests itself as contentment, happiness, bliss. And so that means all these little bad things that you used to say are happening to you. 
the more you stay in this space, you will realize none of that was ever true. Now, of course, there are exceptions, and those are usually our traumas. If I may give an example of mine, when I was 14 years old, my stepdad decided to get up one Saturday morning and punch me in the face. He was a big, green beret, muscle-bound guy, and I was probably all of 100 pounds at 14 years old. And so did I just make this trauma up in my mind because I was trying to avoid bad and chase after good? No. There are exceptions. But what most people suffer over in their life are not just these big traumas. People suffer over hundreds of little things every day and then even more so they add more baggage to their trauma instead of transcending the trauma. So the space that I'm in now, if I look back at this incident with my stepdad at 14, because I've sat with it from this space long enough, it dissolved that trauma. And I look back on that memory more as a factual thing that has happened. And then forgiveness pours forth. And this is how we move on from trauma. But it all comes back to this three simple, three simple steps. We can make it more complicated if we want to, but it's as simple as realizing you've been programmed. It's possible that some of what you eat, you don't even like eating. Your body doesn't want it but because that's the way you were raised or that's the way you were taught or that's what somebody else expects out of you. That's what you continue to do. You've been programmed. You've been conditioned. Maybe even how you connect with your partner physically. Maybe that's not really who you are. But you've learned since you were a kid that if you give people what they want and they're happy, then you get something in return. So, for the most part, what we've done as humans, we sell ourselves short of who we really are. Sometimes quite a bit short. We become something completely what we're not. Now's the chance to rediscover or even to discover for the first time who you really are in this life. But you have to understand, first, you have to, you have to realize you've been programmed. That's not all bad, but a lot of it is. Now, how do we get out of this dualistic good and bad? Well, sometimes you have to use the very thing that you are dissolving, that you are transcending to start out on your journey. So we start off using the mind to get out of the mind, to quiet the mind. What exists beyond the mind? Consciousness, or what I call heart space. Just being here in this moment, being free, being content. Step number one is just to make that recognition. I've been programmed, and to some extent I've been living a lie. It's okay. Don't be hard on yourself. When I first had this epiphany, it, it freaked me out because I realized most of my life was a lie. Some of the people that I was in relationships with, I had no business being in a relationship, but some, some image in my mind drove me to make these steps. Or if I think about all the drugs I did. I was an alcoholic at the age of 14. 
And I can blame that on trauma. But I'm the one that kept it going when at any time I could have done these three simple steps. Realize that you've been programmed. Step number two, realize there is something else besides this program. Something else besides the mind, the thought process. And you can experience that firsthand when the mind goes quiet. Which is why one of the main practices that I teach is meditation. But even if you never meditate a day in your life and you are at step two and you realize there's something else here, then you can use the practice of self-inquiry and just investigate what is this something else. And if that something else becomes something, oh, I know what it is. It's, it's my soul. And this is how I describe my soul. How are you describing the soul? It means maybe you just peeled away another layer and you've and now you're witnessing the next inner layer, but there's still something else witnessing even that. And when you investigate and you keep going deeper and deeper within, and you ask yourself, is this is this new thing that I have found, can it be witnessed? Have I just traded one false identity, one false image, for another false image? But this new false image looks better, and that's fine. It's it's what happens to a lot of people who go to church. I don't fault them. I don't judge them. I don't blame them. They go to church, and they form a new identity. They're still programmed, but sometimes that new church identity is better than an, than an older version of them. Neither one of them is true. And sometimes people do get stuck on this new identity. And that's okay. But what happens when you move beyond all false identities? No words can express it. You have to experience it yourself. But I can say this. When the mind goes quiet and it stays quiet, everything is new, everything is fresh. Somebody says, you want a piece of this apple pie? Apple pie. I don't know. Let me taste it. Somebody calls you up. That friend that you don't really like. But somehow you keep connecting with them and going out to lunch with them. And even though they berate you and what's going on in your life. We've, we've all had relationships like that. Suddenly, there's a, there's, a, there's a certain element within you. The more you sit with the spaciousness where that friend calls you up, you don't, have to, you don't have to say, hey, I've had an awakening. Or you just say, I don't want to go out. And if they say why, you, it can be as easy as I don't know why. I don't have an answer. I just know that I'm listening to how I feel and I don't want to go out. And what happens to your life when you commit yourself to this? You become a whole new you become so new that you're now. That you are just here in this moment. And maybe you do read. From this, from this space, maybe you do pick up books and read them. Maybe you do watch videos on YouTube. 
Maybe you do start practicing yoga and meditation and all of this, and all of this is great. Just keep staying as the witness so that you don't get caught up in anything which is only going to reinvent that suffering within you. You don't have to wear special clothes. You don't have to do anything special. That's how simple it is. You could be a Christian. You could be a Jew. You could be a Muslim. You could be an atheist. And nothing I'm saying challenges the root of any of those titles. Some of you may discard the titles once you make this this discovery for yourself. Others make the discovery and they go even deeper into the religion in which once programmed them is now freeing them. Because then... You become one with the root of what this original belief system was created for in the first place. Unfortunately, they all get manipulated over time to control people. And so once you make this discovery... Just sit back and relax and watch the world unfold without the filters, without the program. Nothing to do, nothing to be. You are free. Three simple steps. Just realize that you've been programmed Realize there's something else that's witnessing that you're realizing you have been programmed. And step number three, just stay as that witness. It's not going to be easy, but it is simple. Just stay as that witness. And watch all these little nuances that once aggravated you fall away. Or all these little things that you try to avoid, such as traffic, you will find yourself sitting in traffic in bliss. This is what started the process for me in the year 2000. And I realized, very much like Eckhart Tolle says, in the introduction in his book, Power of Now, where he says, one night I had this strong feeling that I hated myself. And then he thought, wait a minute, who is the I that hates the self? They must be two different ones within me. Yes, it does seem that way. There's the real you that's the witness. There's the false you that can only lead to suffering because it's not who you really are. And so in the year 2000, something very similar happened to me and I realized, wait a minute. So I made the realization, wait a minute, I've just been programmed. All of this stuff, just program, program, program. I meet someone new, I fall in love with them, I allow them to program me differently. That makes them happy, then they do things that make me happy. But that's not stable. So step number two was realize, well, wait a minute. If if I've been programmed, who is the I that's been programmed? And what happens if it gets unprogrammed? How does this I live itself out in this in this mind and body without a program? Because it's in the universal flow, much like they speak about in Taoism. So 
Step number three is just stay in that flow. And there's something about the universe or God or whatever you want to call it that when you are in that flow, you are being healed. You are being forgiven. And these programs are naturally, energetically, magnetically being taken from you. It's, it's no work on your part. In fact, if anything, you're just going to get in the way. And sometimes we do that. Something very naturally gets lifted from us and we go chasing after it and say, no, I deserve this pain or I deserve this suffering or whatever it is. And you don't. It's not who you are. Anybody can do this. You can't say, but Billy, I've, I've done a lot of bad things in my life. Okay. All that's in your mind. Once you really tap into your truest self, it's like you have a new life and here you are. You can keep going to church if you want to keep going to church. You can keep eating the same food, work at the same job, be in the same relationship. Because none of that will matter mentally. Just be as you are. Just stay in that space. And maybe something does move you to change jobs or relationships or whatever. And that'll be fine too. Follow the flow of freedom and allow that which does not belong to you to naturally be taken from you. I think it's Muji that says, walk through the fire of self-discovery This fire cannot burn you. It can only burn what you are not. It really is that simple. It may take time, even though time is just a mental process. It may seem like it takes time for you to make this discovery until this discovery is complete and you're just free. And that's okay. Because every one step closer to freedom is one step further away from these programs of suffering. Let go, be free, and just stay as this witness. Namaste.